Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Lifespan Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. We continue to grow as an organization and in viewership, and we thank you for making that possible. But the fight against aging is far from over. Here's what's been done in February. Starting off with our research roundup. In an epidemiological study published in Aging, scientists have shown that patients who take lithium have much lower all-cause mortality than patients on other psychotropic drugs. Lithium has long been prescribed for certain psychiatric conditions, mainly bipolar disorder. With time, evidence began to accumulate that lithium might have other benefits for health and longevity. This is similar to what happened with metformin, which is an anti-diabetes drug. Lithium is thought to work by promoting autophagy and stress resistance, but scientists may be just beginning to unravel lithium's full potential. Lithium has been shown to extend lifespan in simple animal models even when administered later in life. Human epidemiological studies also showed a slight bump in life expectancy in regions with trace amounts of lithium in drinking water. Of course, epidemiological studies cannot establish causation and are notoriously hard to interpret. In this new study, epidemiological as well, the researchers used data from UK Biobank, a huge repository of medical information on almost half a million British citizens, to see if taking lithium as a drug was associated with lower all-cause mortality. Patients who took lithium were compared to patients who took psychotropic drugs for at least three consecutive months. While the two groups were largely similar, they differed from each other as well as from the general population. For instance, patients who were prescribed lithium normally took the drug longer than patients who were prescribed other antipsychotic medications and had more consecutive episodes of their diagnosis. Such heterogeneity makes analyzing the data somewhat harder. The scientists attempted to account for as many confounding variables as possible, and they controlled for several comorbidities, including diabetes and cancer, and traits such as sleep quality, smoking, physical activity, alcohol intake, and body mass index. Despite UK Biobank's huge size, the resulting cohorts were not that big. Just 276 lithium users and 552 users of other psychotropic drugs. However, the trend was clear, lithium significantly extended lifespan. Lithium users had 3.6 times lower chances of dying at a given age compared to other antipsychotic drug users. While the data looks very encouraging, it should be interpreted cautiously. First, the study was populational and had a small sample size. Second, patients on psychotropic drugs generally have more health problems and higher mortality than the rest of the population so it is not clear how effective lithium would be in extending lifespan in otherwise healthy people. The researchers themselves note that an alternative interpretation for these findings is that lithium in these patients has fewer lifespan-decreasing effects than other medications used to treat their diagnosis, and therefore it protects its users from side effects which may lead to premature death. Finally, lithium treatment requires a lot of caution and supervision, since lithium levels must be kept inside a narrow range. The results of this study certainly look promising and will fuel the growing interest in lithium as a potential protector. However, more research is needed. Next, researchers publishing in Age and Aging have found that rather than being protective, an increase in dietary protein is associated with an increased chance of sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is a well-known disorder that occurs with aging. People with sarcopenia lack adequate muscular function, leading to frailty, a higher risk of falls, and a functional decline in daily living activities that leads to a decreased quality of life. Previous research into the relationship between protein consumption and sarcopenia has noted the phenomenon of anabolic resistance, in which muscle protein is more difficult to synthesize in older adults. Therefore, the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism, or ESPEN, recommends that older adults consume 1 to 1.3 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight a day. This study used data from a registry of fraternal and identical twins and triplets, and chose community-dwelling older adults that had detailed muscular data available, a subgroup of just over 3,300. As is usual for this kind of study, there were a substantial number of confounding factors. 
While aging is, of course, the primary association, education, BMI, and income were all found to have associations with muscle strength, muscle mass, and sarcopenia. There was no significant association between muscle strength and protein intake one way or another. However, protein intake below the ESPEN recommendations was, to the researchers' surprise, significantly correlated with a reduced incidence of low muscle mass and sarcopenia. Similarly, protein intake in excess of the ESPEN recommendations was correlated with a greater risk of low muscle mass and sarcopenia. The researchers considered multiple potential reasons behind these findings. One of them is the idea that the causality might be reversed, that people who suffer from sarcopenia may be consuming more protein in an effort to treat the condition. The researchers find this to be unlikely, as sarcopenia is seldom diagnosed. Diets that are high in protein might also be high in inflammatory or other negative factors that promote sarcopenia, so it might be the source of protein that is the root cause of these results. While this study was biased towards healthy volunteers, it offers highly contrary evidence to the conventional wisdom surrounding protein and sarcopenia, and it may result in reevaluations of ESPEN and other dietary health guidelines. This is an association study that does not prove causation, but it makes it clear that simply eating more protein is not likely to protect anyone against developing sarcopenia. Exercise may be somewhat effective in fighting back against this disease, but more fundamental biological interventions are likely to be required to prevent it for good. Moving on, in a paper published in Nature Aging, researchers have shown that caloric restriction modestly slows down the pace of aging in healthy young people as measured by one of the DNA methylation clocks. A plethora of animal data has shown beneficial effects of caloric restriction for health and longevity. Human trials, albeit not that numerous, also suggest rejuvenation-promoting properties of eating less. Comprehensive assessment of long-term effects of reducing intake of energy or calorie was a two-phase trial designed to explore the effect of caloric restriction in healthy people. Phase 2 was a randomized controlled trial conducted in three centers over a two-year period. The participants were men aged 21 to 50 years and premenopausal women aged 21 to 47 years who had normal BMI or were slightly overweight. They were assigned to either a caloric restriction group eating 25% less than what they normally consume or a control group eating their regular diet. The participants' adherence to the caloric restriction diet was then assessed by their weight loss. Based on previous studies, scientists know how much weight the participants are expected to lose with a 25% reduction in caloric intake. Therefore, they can just compare the participants' actual weight loss with a predicted weight loss trajectory. In this publication, the researchers focused on DNA methylation data obtained from the participants of the Calorie Phase II trial. Epigenetic clocks use genome-wide methylation patterns to estimate biological age and predict mortality risks. The researchers used multiple clocks, and the Pheno Age and Grim Age clocks did not show any difference between the caloric restriction and control groups. However, Dunedin Pace demonstrated a reduction in the aging pace of the participants on the restrictive diet. An important shortcoming the researchers faced was that, on average, participants in the caloric restriction group could only achieve an approximately 12% reduction in consumed calories, not the prescribed 25%. The scientists then tested if the pace of aging was slower in people who managed to achieve a higher caloric reduction. Indeed, the effect was better in people who achieved more than 10% caloric restriction than people who managed less than 10% as measured by Dunedin Pace. The authors admit that while only one out of three aging clocks showed a difference between caloric restriction and regular diet groups, this might be explained by the different methods on which the clocks are based. Dunedin pace could be a more sensitive measure, and the effect of caloric restriction on aging that it detected is in line with previous calorie results. This study adds to the growing body of evidence showing that caloric restriction has a beneficial effect on longevity. However, it also raises a number of questions and confirms some reservations. For example, it is unclear if caloric restriction works for people with lower BMI. In this study, the participants were either on the higher end of normal BMI or overweight. This study has also shown that achieving significant caloric restriction is not feasible for many people. Moreover, the effect of caloric restriction seems to depend on which measures are chosen to estimate it and varies from person to person. That's it for our research roundup. You can find more on these and other stories on our website at lifespan.io forward slash roundup.
In February Life Noggin released three new videos, one discussing the health benefits of having friends, one exploring the idea that love could make humans do stupid things, and one examining the real-life zombie fungus featured in The Last of Us. Here's a sample of that one. I'm gonna geek out for a second, if you don't mind. I got a good segue later, I, I promise. The Last of Us is so good. The characters, the acting, the amount of tissues I'm gonna consume as the show goes on. Every episode is mentally destroying me. And speaking of mentally destroying, see? Let's talk about the mind hacking fungus that turns you into a zombie in the show. Don't worry, there's no way that's real, right? Right? Oh my- Animator, Triangle Bob burned the house down on purpose this time! Get this thing out of here, we're all gonna die! Hey there! Welcome to Life Noggin. This zombie fungus is one of over 400 species that belong to the genus Cordyceps. Most of these species are parasitic, targeting insects, taking over their bodies, and eventually killing them, all in the name of reproduction. Yay! One of the most studied species is Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, which infects carpenter ants. When the spores of this fungus make contact with a carpenter ant, they attach and grow throughout its body, draining it of its nutrients, and eventually taking control over its muscles. The fungus makes the ant leave the nest, climb onto a leaf, and bite down hard. The fungus then devours the ant and sprouts growths that burst and release more spores. Nature is so beautiful, isn't it? The process takes anywhere from four days to two weeks. While this may look like mind control, studies have found that the fungus never penetrates the brain. Instead, it controls the body by forming networks encircling the muscles and invading the muscle fibers. Scientists believe the fungus then secretes chemicals that make the muscles contract. And while the parts of the brain that control movement of these body parts dies off, the rest of the brains remain intact, at least until the ant itself dies. This could mean that the ant is alive and aware of what's happening as it's being physically manipulated. Kind of makes you feel bad for beheading all those clickers. Uh, almost. But luckily, they're only make-believe. And as actual zombie fungus experts have explained, there's no current cordyceps species capable of infecting humans or any other mammal. And if one did somehow evolve to do so, they most likely wouldn't be sophisticated enough to control your body. In fact, humans have actually been ingesting one cordyceps species for centuries in order to gain a variety of health benefits. Seriously, this one is called Ophiocordyceps sinensis, and it grows from the caterpillar of the Hepialis moth. It's a traditional Tibetan and Chinese herb, and it's used to treat everything from colds to kidney disorders to cancer. While some preliminary research has shown promising results, there haven't been many human studies, so more evidence is still needed to truly know its effectiveness. Nevertheless, the Ophiocordyceps sinensis market is really competitive. If you want to buy the real thing, it will cost you over $20,000 per kilogram. So now, don't worry, you can just let the TV show an excellent video game mentally destroy you without the fear of the fungus. For now. Just kidding. I will not hesitate to burn every house down. I, w I won't. Make sure to visit the Life Noggin YouTube channel for more. Also, in February Lifespan News host Emmett Short released a number of videos exploring the latest in longevity science. One of those episodes focused on recent research demonstrating that gene therapy could provide the regenerative abilities of zebrafish to other animals. Here's what that was like. Some animals like zebrafish can regenerate their body, their brain, retina, spinal cord, hearts, and a ton of other tissues, and soon we might be able to too. So it got me thinking about Wolverine. Wolverines don't regenerate. Why aren't there any superheroes based on zebrafish? So I got our graphics team to mock up a few Oh. Okay. Ooh. Ugh. Uh-huh. Wow. Okay. Yikes. Uh, never mind. I get, I get it now. Welcome to Lifespan News. I'm Emmett Short. Today we're talking about gene therapy to create regenerating metahumans. Why? Because it's Tuesday, and that's what we do here. The journal Cell Stem Cell, and yes, that is a name, weird name, has published a study about animals that have been given the zebrafish-like ability to restore their heart muscle after injury. According to the paper, you don't want genes responsible for regeneration stuck in the on position. That's how you get tumors. In zebrafish, these genes are controlled by trees. 
tissue regeneration enhancer elements, trees. And trees only turn on regenerative genes when they sense an injury. Heart tissue doesn't normally regenerate in adult mammals, but you're gonna love this. In two similar experiments, researchers genetically engineered mice to express zebrafish trees in a way that would show visual indications only during injury response. And it worked. In uninjured mice, there was no gene expression, but in the injured mice, the trees lit up like Christmas. The best part? It worked whether the injection was given before or immediately after the injury. So if this was a therapy, it could be conceivably given after a heart attack. Similar results were seen in pigs. They didn't have enough virus to infect the entire pig, so they just injected the pig's hearts. And I get that, okay? These are tough economic times. I've stopped shopping at Whole Foods, so why inject an entire pig's body when you can get the same information with a much smaller dosage? There's no reason to go hog wild. The point is, even with just treating the heart, they got similar results to the mice. The indicators were only visible at the injury sites. So that's the targeting mechanism with trees. Now, the final experiments involved a molecule called YAP. There's a pun there. I'm going to pass it up because I respect you. YAP is a transcriptional cofactor that causes rapid cell growth and division when overexpressed. Without a tree to turn it on and off, genetically modifying animals to express YAP in the heart kills them within days due to basically having overgrown hearts. In the final test for restoring heart function, they used trees to control YAP expression, and they were able to restore core metrics of cardiac function, whether the injection was given before or immediately after the injury, and it improved function over an injured control group. YAP was only expressed during the injuries and only at injury sites. Basically, it turned off after the injury was healed. So tissue that can't heal itself did. Incredible. This was not yet a human clinical trial, but it is a significant step towards one and has the potential to become the standard of care for treating heart or who knows how many other types of damaged tissue. Imagine regrowing limbs, severed spinal cords, or turning about the clock on your entire body. I need surgery on my thumb in April. I wish I could just get an injection and have it just repair itself. That'd be amazing. Maybe if I live long enough, that will be a reality. When there's more to share, we'll have it for you here. So make sure you subscribe and click the bell so you can stay up to date on aging research. I'm Emmett Short, and we'll see you next time on Lifespan News. Other episodes of Lifespan News include ones discussing an mRNA wrinkle vaccine, the relationship between NMN and a type of difficult to treat breast cancer, and using cellular reprogramming to extend mouse lifespan. Visit the Lifespan News YouTube channel to find these and more. Closing things out with two quick news nuggets. First, we are excited about the newly formed Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Longevity Science. The Longevity Science Caucus aims to increase funding for aging and longevity biotechnology, streamline regulations, and promote initiatives to increase the healthy average lifespan of Americans. This is a major step towards ensuring that the latest advancements in aging and longevity research are made accessible to all. Secondly, the company Selvi, part of the portfolio of biotechnology holding company Kizu Technology Capital, recently received $5.5 million to develop a mitochondria-based therapy. Selvi, which is described as a leader in therapeutic mitochondria transplantation, an approach developed at Harvard Medical School, will use the financing to get Series A ready by the end of 2023. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast.